and welcome to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Glad you're with us. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. We have a guest today that I don't believe we've had this guy on before. Have we had him on before? We, we have not. Uh, yeah, the Honorable, I so. Honorable Bill Graves, who sits in the 7th Judicial District of Oklahoma on the state court bench, has written a very scholarly work uh, dealing with whether or not we have a constitutional crisis in this country or not. Uh, be, meaning a federal constitutional crisis, not a state constitutional mm -hmm. crisis. And he's going to come talk to us about that and what are the uh, implications of what's going on and what changes, if any, should be made. Well, uh, Bill Graves has had a, a long career in public service. I don't know how we've done 472 shows and not had him on before, but we're going to make up for that today. It's coming up next on The Verdict. Bill Graves joining us. Uh, we'll, we'll be right back. A greener planet, cleaner air, a healthy economy, national security, a smaller deficit and a stronger dollar, green jobs, better jobs, energy independence, warmth and light and transportation. These are the reasons Chesapeake champions natural gas every day. We'll see Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. We'll see Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today, we're really pleased to have the Honorable Bill Graves sitting, uh, sitting with us today. He's a sitting judge in the 7th Judicial District here in Oklahoma County. Uh, judge Graves did his undergraduate work at the University of Oklahoma and his law work at Oklahoma City University. He worked as an attorney in the city attorney's office, was engaged in private practice for many years. Also, for 24 years, he served uh, honorably in the uh, state house of representatives. He was elected district judge here in Oklahoma County in 2006, and this is his first visit to the verdict. Judge, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, this is a, not a new experience, but still relatively new compared to your length of time in the, in the legislature. How do you like it on the bench? I like it. It's been a real uh, rewarding experience. It's been a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the cases you come up uh, brought by lawyers like Kent around <laughs> here. And, uh, but it, uh, I enjoy it. It's being part of the mm -hmm. justice system. And uh, I think it's, it's real rewarding. Is it, it like you thought it'd be? Uh, well, it's better. I, I was really kind of reluctant to become a judge. And, and then uh, my legislative career ended and some people wanted me to run for it, so I did. But I've been glad that I did. Well, Judge, a uh, consistent topic among the bar is what an what a, uh, informal yet formal enough atmosphere there is in your courtroom and how people feel at home, uh, maybe not with the result they get, but with the way they're treated. They feel, feel like they're being treated fairly and, uh, and it's not as intimidating as they had thought. You're to be commended for creating that kind of an atmosphere. Well, thank you. I've I think the golden rule applies to judges as well as everybody else. <laughs> how did you find your uh, 24 years of legislative experience? How did that impact your thinking and your, your work as a judge? Well, it, uh, being a, a part of the legislative as well as judicial, I, I realize that uh, the legislature is the branch that makes the laws and the courts are the ones that uh, construe them and decide cases and controversies. and. Uh, that's helped me to realize my job now, I'm not there to make law anymore. 
Mm -hmm. is, is that a different perspective that you have to bring to your job? Uh, it is uh, because you're there to, especially the fact that, uh, you know, that your vote is, like I said, the only one that uh, is there. So mm -hmm. I have to make the right decision. I, I pray that I'll be given wisdom mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do that. And uh, so uh, hopefully uh, I've interpreted what's been told to me <laughs> in that you, regard. You represent a judicial district. Roughly geographically, where, where is that district? Uh, it's the uh, western part of Oklahoma County. It uh, uh, borders uh, on the east on at May, uh, approximately, and then on, uh, I believe on the north, west, and south, uh, approximately the county line. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so how many people approximately live in that uh, Area. Do you have any oh, idea? you would ask that. I <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm guessing a half million or so. Anyway, yeah, there's I mean, a bunch. It's, it's yeah, a, yeah, there's a lot of people. There, there's about. Uh, I forgot the number of votes. Anyway, there's still, even though it's just a part of Oklahoma County, there's still a great number of. Uh, it's a pretty dense area, anyway. It, to some extent, did that does that overlap with where your uh, House of Representatives right. district uh, was? Right. Fortunately, that uh, all my old legislative districts entirely in. The judicial district, which really helps, because I had a had a head start in in those precincts, which were in my legislative district. Judge, let me ask you about this article that you've written. Uh, that's going to be uh, in part to some of what we're talking about today. Uh, you suggest that uh, there may be a constitutional crisis in the country uh, with some things that are going on uh, in the courts and outside. Can you tell our viewers uh, why you wrote this article? What what uh, prompted you to do it? Well, I, I think it's important that uh, we all understand and kind of review what the purpose of the Constitution was and uh, what the framers had in mind. And uh, it's an overview of the convention and, and uh, the writing and ratification of the Constitution. It's about what the framers wanted to do in regard to the powers of the federal government and those of the states. Ironically, the they framers did not view the courts as being the supreme arbiter of the Constitution. Actually, the presidents were for a long time, and it's about uh, I discuss the uh, how the original intent in many cases has been departed from by the courts and I think the Congress, and uh, in favor of what's called a, a evolutionary law or a living constitution, and uh, I discuss is how we've departed or taken God and Christ out of the public square, contrary to what the framers wanted, and uh, it's. Uh, discuss in, in great part uh, how the federalism has been diminished in, in favor of a larger and bigger central government. Well, <clears throat> uh, you just, uh, the, I guess the, this article now is pending publication, hasn't been uh, published no, yet. I'm, I, not yet, no. Uh, uh, but if someone wanted to get a copy of that uh, article we're talking about today, uh, can they, uh, I guess, make they can get in touch with us mm -hmm. on our website? that we'll give at the end of the show. Okay, that'd your be permission, fine, sure. You we'll, make, we'll make copies of the article available to anybody. That I've already it. handed some out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, what did you find? What very general conclusions have you come to uh, finishing your work now on this article? We'll get into some specific things in okay. a little bit. Well, the, the Constitution <clears throat> is really a, a product of the uh, Protestant <clears throat> Reformation in America. And that's really how America was founded. But based on that, the, the founders, the framers, knew or were aware very much of the sin nature of man. Uh, George Washington, who presided at the Constitutional Convention, said uh, once that government is not reason or eloquence, it is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. And the framers understood this and wanted to curb the use of power by men and by government. And uh, they did this by... The uh, uh, Constitution is really a compact between sovereign states, and uh, they sought to uh, the, set up uh, three branches of government uh, in order to do this. And uh, they provided in the, uh, 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 Hamilton provided in the Federalist, uh, he was one of the authors in number 80, that the powers of the judiciary would be coextensive with those of the federal, uh, the legislative. And, uh, executive branches, which means that they'd have this, it would have the same boundaries. Mm -hmm. So 
I, what I hear you say is that originally the, the framers of the Constitution wanted the states to be stronger than they are today. Today we have a very strong federal government, and what you're saying was that the, the original framers were hoping that the states would have more authority than they do today. Exactly. They, uh, they saw that the <coughs> Articles of Confederation were not working, mm -hmm. and so they wanted to the, have a central government or federal government to handle the matters that were, they couldn't handle as states individually, and that's what they did. Uh, with the Constitution. Well, how would it be different? If states had more authority today, what, what would be different? Well, you'd have, uh, I think it's Jefferson, I quote him a lot, uh, thought that government was best at the <coughs> local level, and I think you'd have more of that. And uh, this is, uh, Franklin said that uh, they gave us a republic, and of course the, uh, the Constitution says each state shall have a republican form of government, and uh, we'd have more representation, more government at the local level, and less uh, from a far off capital right. like Washington. So, so currently local governments operate within the enabling legislature of the federal and the state government. And what you're saying is that the federal would have less authority and so right. the local governments would have more authority to determine the, the way that their community wanted to, to Exactly, to uh, like uh, Madison said, who's been called the father of the Constitution, that the powers of the federal government were few and defined while those of the states were numerous and indefinite. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution, uh, the federal government's getting cer uh, given certain enumerated powers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Madison said that uh, the states, uh, because of that, retained an inviolable uh, sovereignty over the reserve powers, or those not given to the federal government. Okay, well, specific to this to this argument about uh, that states should have uh, uh, more power, local government should have more power. When, when did it start to evolve in, in, in the direction where, it, where it's ended up? Were, were the first 50 years, did we, did, we, did we go immediately wrong after the Constitution? Or was it, say, in the last 50 years that the federal government has taken on more and more responsibility? Well, I, I think uh, it started the most in that direction whenever the 14th Amendment was passed. Mm -hmm. It was held that the 14th Amendment applied, or it was argued, that the 14th Amendment applied the Bill of Rights to the states. This was rejected by the courts for almost 50 years, and then uh, 1925, there was a case that held it, it was, uh, did apply the Bill of Rights. Well, uh, this was called the Incorporation Doctrine, and by that it gave the, uh, the, the Supreme Court and Congress a lot more powers than they were really intended to have. Ironically, the 14th Amendment was uh, uh, has a questionable uh, ratification. Congress didn't have the votes to pass it and it was argued, so they disenfranchised all the representatives from the southern states in the House and the Senate, and they reduced the required number of two-thirds and passed it. Hmm. And then it, uh, it came up, it was right short of ratification. It finally had, they said they had 29 votes, needed 28 to be ratified, yet two states which had previously ratified, rescinded, but they wouldn't count that. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to get to a break. The Honorable okay. Bill Gray is joining us. He has some, some issues with the way the Constitution has evolved through the years. We'll get to those important ideas next on The Verdict. To be Chickasaw, you have strength, you have faith, and your family comes first. I was diagnosed with FSGS, which is a progressive kidney disease that leads to kidney failure. I believe that um, being Chickasaw makes me strong. It made me a strong mother for Melissa. She told me that day, don't worry, I'll be there for you. I've got two kidneys, you can have one. They took me in first, and we just hugged each other, and I said, Melissa, it's almost time. It's going to be all right. My mom has given me life twice, and how do you ever thank someone for giving you a second chance? Through those challenging times, my family and I knew that we were going to get through it, that we are a Chickasaw family, and that whatever obstacle may arise, together we will conquer it. 
in Oklahoma with the technology that's being developed every day. It would be difficult to get much better than it is now, but I anticipate that it will. Technology is always going to improve. It's always going to get better, and as it does, these fields will give up more and more of their natural resources. I think with technology and, and the way they're doing it, it'll be a good, clean, environmental place and uh, I'm blessed to be here. The oil and gas industry runs deep in our history and gives us a sense that we have a really strong future ahead of us. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. We're visiting with the Honorable Bill Graves about the Constitution, his views on how that's evolved through the years. Kent, where do you want to go here? I'd like to take a step back and, and focus on the word federalism. Can you tell our viewers kind of generally uh, a, a layperson's definition of federalism? Well, uh, to me, uh, I believe the framers meant it uh, as, as a, a compact, as I said, of, of sovereign states uh, under the uh, <clears throat> Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Paris, under which America really became a nation, and the Articles of Confederation that provided that the states would be sovereign. And so they ceded a part of their powers at the convention uh, to the federal government, but retained the rest. And uh, So as a conce conceptual matter, federalism would say that we started out with the the original states uh, having all power, right. ceded some of it to the federal government for uh, purposes as set forth in the Constitution, but retained all that wasn't ceded to them. Right, and a lot of, you know, a lot of things weren't working out, so they needed a central power, yeah. they decided, but they wanted to just limit it, have a limited federal government. I think that's what they mm -hmm. set up. Okay. What do you think about uh, the, the separation between church and state and how those uh, issues are, are now dealt with in the Constitution? Do you feel like the, the original intent of the framers of the Constitution, their wishes are being held today? Well, uh, Justice Story, in his commentaries, he's been called the greatest scholar ever to sit on the court. He said that uh, by the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, was trying only to prohibit a national church. Mm -hmm. And there were several states that had official state churches, and it says uh, that they didn't mean to interfere with that or prohibit an official state church. But the Supreme Court came along and, and contrary to some of their own decisions, held that uh, virtually that you got to, had to take God and Christ totally out when all the framers wanted to do is prohibit a one particular Christian sect from becoming a state church. The framers wanted a Christian nation. Is, are you I believe so. I, I certainly do. Uh, and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, in fact, in 1892, said that America was a Christian nation after examining hundreds of documents. Mm -hmm. And there's also a lot of more opinions besides that one. Does that seem to imply that non-Christians are not welcome? No, I don't think so at all. Uh, at the same time, I don't think their presence means that we have to diminish uh, the foundations of our country and what it's based on, what our laws were based on. Uh, you know, under the common law, Blackstone, who the, his, the common law was very dominant in America in the, in the founding, he said that laws, civil laws should be based on natural law, the law of nature and revelation or the Bible. Well, you've seen the evolution uh, uh, over a number of years and, of course, read about many, many more uh, of the Supreme Court and the construing the uh, separation of church and state doctrine by the Supreme Court. Do you see any, any trend nowadays with the current court toward a more traditional approach to that than perhaps has been the case in the past? Well, I was encouraged to uh, see a decision recently by the court uh, held up the use of a cross in some... I, I didn't have read the case, but it's read about in the paper at some public facility, uh, which was, I think that's certainly appropriate. A nature preserve or something right. like that. Right, and it was, a, Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion, he was probably the swing vote. Unfortunately, they didn't re decide to review the case involving the Ten Commandments here in Oklahoma. Uh, so one could get real mixed signals from looking at the right. Yeah, you sure could. where they're going. Right, exactly. Let's switch to the health care issue that's kind of before the United States today. And you've seen what the administration and what Congress has as its intentions. Right. And then there seems to be some question about whether or not it's constitutional and states are lining up and some want to take on the, 
the federal government on this issue. Where do you stand on this, and what do you think the chances are that this uh, will be successful? Well, reading Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution, uh, there's no power in the part of Congress to enact such a law. So, I, I, in my opinion, it's not constitutional. And also, it requires that people, citizens, purchase health insurance. Mm -hmm. That may be a good thing, but I don't think Congress has the power under the Constitution to require that. If Hamilton said that uh, the laws made in pursuance of the Constitution would be su the supreme law of the land, mm -hmm. but he said if they were not in pursuance of that, it, they'd be usurpation of power, it wouldn't be supreme law. Now, but, in, in general, though, I mean, someone has to have car insurance, but is the difference is that that's regulated by the state and not by the federal government? Is that, would that be the decision? Well, it, I think they pointed out driving is a privilege, so it wouldn't really count, but I they, see, they, I they, see. You don't have to drive. You don't right, have to have insurance right, if you choose not uh, to drive. I right. see. And, but they're, of course, saying that, they get the law saying you've got to purchase, they, they're arguing that this is okay under the Commerce Clause, but I think the Commerce Clause contemplates a voluntary exchange of something between persons, not something coerced by the federal government. I thought under the Commerce Clause that it, you didn't have to uh, pursue uh, trade in commerce if you didn't want to, but if you did, you had certain protections against being discriminated against by, by right. states uh, if you're in interstate commerce. That's and, the point you're making. Right. Yes. And one thing interesting, in, in 1824, in a, a pretty famous case, Gibbons versus Ogden, Ogden uh, Chief Justice Marshall, he said that under the Commerce Clause, Congress had no power to regulate health care. And so that's pretty interesting. It's probably mm -hmm. dicta in the yeah. case, but it's certainly, hmm. I think, something that they ought to look at now. Let's, you've written this scholarly report, and I hope many of our viewers will take a, take a chance to, to pursue a reading it at some point. If your idea caught fire, if, if people decided that Judge Graves is right and we really do need to get back to the original intent of the Constitution, how would you change it? What, what, what series of steps would be necessary to revert back to the original intent of, of the framers of the Constitution? Well, I, I think First, uh, we need to, the Republicans and Democrats both need to do a better job of appointing people on the, to the Supreme Court because mm -hmm. uh, uh, they. Uh, I think we've got a lot of people on there that uh, are liberal that don't really believe in the Constitution, the original intent, and more inclined toward mm -hmm. the living Constitution or uh, uh, evolving law. But uh, I think under Article Three of the Constitution. The Congress has the power to modify and regulate the uh, juris appellate jurisdiction of the U.S. Supreme Court, and it ha has only about three cases where it has original jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But the Congress could pass laws taking away jurisdiction from the court in, in so many areas as they've done in the past. So you would suggest that in the vetting process for a candidate for the Supreme Court, one of the critical questions they should be asked is whether or not they believe in the original intent of the framers of the Constitution or that the Constitution is some sort of living document that is always subject to change. Right, yeah, I, I kind of agree with Justice Scalia. He, ask him about the living constitution. He said, I prefer the dead constitution. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but didn't the framers intend uh, 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 that uh, the judiciary be independent? Didn't they support uh, right, independent exactly. judiciary? Right, exactly. And I certainly support that myself. I think they, they meant for the, the uh, judiciary to be independent from the political process and not uh, be under the same pressures. And I think that's one reason they kind of gave lifetime appointments. At the same time, I don't think they meant for the judiciary to be independent of the Constitution and the laws. To be free to do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. All right. Judge, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Judge. Judge Bill Graves, our guest today on The Verdict. Kent, and I'll be back with a final word right after this. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. 
A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. We're back. Judge Bill Graves was our guest today on The Verdict. Uh, what an interesting guy, able to speak uh, not only to the issues of today and that he deals with in district court, but also to the, to the framers of the Constitution, their intent, the evolving document that is now our Constitution. He has strong opinions. He does, and uh, very timely, because as you know, we have a vacancy now on the U.S. Supreme mm -hmm. Court, and there's a lot of discussion about how uh, the uh, new uh, justice ought to be uh, appointed, what qualities should the justice have, and that's some of the things that we uh, were talking about today. Uh, reasonable people can differ on uh, whether you do the original tent, intent to construction or, uh, or an evolutionary type uh, construction, but, uh, and that's, in, that's an argument that's been raging for many, many years, and uh, we didn't solve today, nor will we, but uh, the court clearly is leaning uh, more at the, at the current moment toward a more uh, original intent uh, uh, position than has been true in the past. Well, we certainly appreciate Judge Graves uh, giving us time today on the verdict and certainly the many years he's uh, provided in public service. An, an extraordinary man and I want to leave you with our website address. If you have an idea for a guest you'd like to see on the verdict, we'd like to hear from you. Go to our website, theverdict.tv, theverdict.tv. That's going to do it for this week's show. For Kent, I'm Mick. We'll see you next week on The Verdict. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.